Okay. Let's see. Let's put this somewhere fairly safe. How about right there? Good. Okay, so uh, I was asked to come and speak to you all a little bit about the history of open source and why we do this, why we're here, and uh, hopefully to connect you to the mission of open source. So first I have to ask, aside from PHP, how many of you are con contributors to open source at all? Great. How many of you have been doing it for five years? Keep your hands up. Ten years? Fifteen years? Oh, good. Well, we got a few lifers, and that's good. That, that's going to be important later, because you guys are going to do well with the quiz. Okay, first I want to congratulate us, pat us on the back. We are made of win, right? I, by the way, I, I gimped in that little OSI logo myself. Feel free to steal the slide. Um, as we know now, everybody knows how great open source is. We've known for a long time, right? I mean, 85% of websites use PHP. It's, pr it's pretty obvious. Um, but everybody thinks this now. And, and it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. Because <laughs> we have a wave of new people turning up. And most of them do not know <laughs> what we know about the fights that, that occurred to get us to this place that we're at now. So part of this, the intent of this is to help people understand some of that. And, and since a lot of you are old timers, it's also to remind you what your job is. Okay? So the new, the new uh, recruits are not battle tested, right? And what that means is they, they weren't here for all of, the, all of the wars. They're confused about whether they're working for love or money. They're much more interested in money than we were. I mean, it's nice to get money. It's nice to get paid. It's nice to have really nice tools to get your work done, and that's what motivated most of us back in the day. But these days, I hear things that are troubling, like, uh, what if the VCs get angry at us? I'm like, oh, man, we do not want to pander to the VCs. Trust me, they'll figure out how to work with us. Let's make it work for us, and then they'll, they'll figure it out, right? Um, years and years ago, I went, I, uh, the very first Homeland Security uh, head, Tim O'Reilly, took me to visit him. And he was all up in arms because um, we Linux people were not making Linux secure enough for him. And he kept saying, we, you Linux people, you Linux people. It was just Tim and me sitting in the room. Right? <laughs> and I finally said, okay, so first of all, there are no Linux people in this room. But also, they mostly live in Europe. They don't care if you use their operating system. You're going to either figure it out or you're not. You know? <laughs> and he was very surprised. But that's kind of the truth, right? They don't know when to push back. And that's a real problem. They don't know where and when they can push back. So, and they do not understand the extent to which we stand on the shoulders of giants. And we used to say this all the time, and then it stopped being fashionable. But it's really true. Um, most of you who are involved in PHP probably know this because you know one of the giants. But we're going to do a quiz now to see how many giants you know. Who's this? Anybody? Arguably one of the fathers of open source. This is Bill Joy. He wrote, PH, er, he wrote the BSD port of Unix, was the first major port of Unix. He was a student at the time at Cal. He wanted their PDP to run Unix, and because he was a really good programmer and, uh, and young, he thought, oh, I'll just do this, <laughs> right? And, uh, and it was very, very successful, because later it's, it was the founding operating system for Sun Microsystems. All right. I know you guys know this one. Anybody? That is Richard Stallman, the other father. Um, he uh, is the man who got locked out of his own system at MIT uh, because he wasn't a student anymore. You know, he got a graduate degree, right? He was there. He was going every day write, writing code. And then he graduated. And he kept going every day and writing code because it was MIT's lab. It was nice, you know? And at one point, they went, yeah, we got to get rid of the people that don't go to school here anymore. So they put passwords on everything. And that really freaked him out. <laughs> He envisioned the whole free software world just from that act, which is kind of amazing. How about this one? Bet nobody's going to get this one. No? No pearl mongers out there? That is Alison Randall. She's really, really impressive. She was the first president of the Pearl Foundation. She was the lead on the Parrot VM. She was the CTO of Canonical, which produces Ubuntu. And uh, she's just going back to school to get a PhD. But she is really, really solid. The reason that she got 
to where she was, and I'm sorry for the terrible picture of her. There are no good pictures of this woman. She's actually really pretty. Was because of this guy. Anybody know who this guy is? There you go. So Larry Wall wrote Pearl, all the versions. And the thing that's interesting about Larry is he's got daughters. And he was the first open source guy that I knew about who really encouraged women to take serious roles of leadership in his organization, which is how Allison got to that place. Um, and I think it's really interesting what he did. The reason that he wrote Pearl was because he's a religious man. He thought that he was going to go on pilgrimage as part of his practice. And so in school, he took linguistics because he figured he'd need to know how to learn languages. And then he wrote one. So, all right. How about this one? No, famous browser. A lot of you guys use it. This is Mitchell Baker. She is the general manager and chief lizard wrangler of Mozilla. And the story I want to tell you about Mitchell is when she worked on Mozilla, initially she was just the lawyer. She wrote the license. But she became intrigued. And so she kind of stuck around. And eventually they made her the general manager of the division of Netscape that, that produced Mozilla. And she learned a ton. She spent a lot of time on it. Um, she got very passionate about it. And then AOL bought Netscape. And they did that because they wanted to own a browser. And so they had changes they wanted to put in that browser for their business model. And she was vetting the changes through the community, like you're supposed to do. And they thought that that was problematic because it took longer. So they fired her. And she kind of dusted herself off. She went home. She logged on. She kept running the project from her house. And all of the engineers kept deferring to her, which really freaked AOL out. <laughs> so then they decided, OK, we get it. We get it. It's us, not you. We're just going to defund it. She called me up. I was at Sun at the time. And she said, oh my god, they're going to pull the plug. And we were suing Microsoft at the time for any competitive practices. And one of our partners in that lawsuit was Jim Clark, one of the co-founders of Netscape. And so we couldn't let it die. We needed a free browser. So we called up some of our friends at IBM. And together, we went in and convinced AOL to give the IP up to the Mozilla Foundation and some seed money so that they wouldn't die. And they took sort of the core of engineers. We found jobs for everybody else in the world you know, that, so they could still continue but the core of the engineers were covered for a year, and they went knuckles down and wrote Firefox. So, she, you know, what I'm telling you is that open source people, the original open source people, were uppity, okay? You guys know this one. You're going to totally get in trouble if you don't know this one. <laughs> Everybody knows? Okay, so you probably know he's a really nice guy. He never meant to write a language. He was just fixing something for himself, right? That, that sort of humility, oh, I never meant to write a language, is, is part of it too. You know, you're proud of the stuff you did, but you're not so proud of it that, that it gets in the way of you talking to people and helping people come into your world. This is what it means to be a leader in open source. And you guys, I, th I think, are going to find that you're all leaders too. So here's your sort of timeline. And I use this, these slides all over the world. Notice PHP is right there, 1995. By the way, I noticed this morning that the Wikipedia page is, is screwed up because <laughs> it first says 1994 and then it says 1995. Somebody's got to fix that. I used to be the CTO of Wikipedia, and that was the first time that I ever worked in a project that was really PHP-centric. So I learned a ton about your community when I was doing that work. All right. One more guy, and I know none of you know him, unless you know Postgres. Anybody here know Postgres? This is Josh Burkus. And the reason I want you to know about Josh is he, this is the kind of uppity you can be from the middle of the pack. So Josh is not Stonebreaker. He's, you know, he didn't write the thing. But he's a major proponent of the thing. He's a booster for it. And when he worked for Sun, he wrote this article, which you can go find. You just have to look, Google that title. Basically, what it said was, Sun, you're fucking up. <laughs> you're you're going to kill this community. And here's the way you're doing it was a very uppity behavior. I mean, he was an employee at Sun Microsystems, but he did this because it was the right thing to do for the community. So part of being involved in open source is doing the right thing, even if it's a little scary, even if it feels like it might you know, impact you. There's a way to do it, of course. So um, 
the problem is that along with that wave of cookies, there's also a lot of money coming into open source, a lot of money. There has been money all along. I mean, IBM famously spent a billion dollars uh, on the initial uh, launch of their, their love of Linux. But crazy money is coming now, right? I mean, has anybody owned any Bitcoins out there? What are you doing here, dude? <laughs> all right. The thing is that companies like to have points of control. They like to massage the message. And open source isn't like that. We like to tell the truth. We like to just say what's happening, mostly. And so there's a clash coming. There was one before. So, you know, the Apache license got rewritten a few years ago. Well, more than a few now. The reason they rewrote it was partially to tighten up the trademark protections because people were slamming code into Apache, doing a big press release, and then running away because all they wanted was the little marketing lift, right? So we've had to train some companies in the past, but there's more of this coming. And those of you who work as consultants or work in large companies, this is part of your job is to help train your company. Because even some of our friends get this wrong, right? Red Hat got this wrong. <laughs> the open source company had to be shown that they couldn't obscured the sources to a product that was based on GPL code. They had to publish them. Somebody reverse compiled RHEL as CentOS, and they initially they were really upset about it, and then they, you know, got to where they understood why it was there. So, um, you know, we have to remind even our friends. We have to keep everybody accountable. Personally, I don't think that open source needs editing. I think it's already a masterpiece. I don't think that any adjectives applied before open source make sense. So corporate open source doesn't make sense to me. It's just open source. <laughs> if you can't, from inside your corporation, figure out how to do it, you're screwing up, right? It's, it's not where it's gotten because it's a simple model that's easy to understand. I served on the board of the OSI for 10 years. Pretty much every year, some new industry would enter with a license that had a carve out especially in field of endeavor, that was really important for their business model. And we'd have to spend six months talking them off that position because we could not bend on field of endeavor. It's such a slippery slope. And just, just a couple months ago, I saw one from inside open source. So one of the things that the new wave thinks about money is that the freeloader problem is a, is a really big problem that has to be solved now. That's the one where people don't pay or don't give code back. They just use it. And, you know, that problem is not new. It's an old problem. And what they wanted was a carve out. They wanted the license to say, if, you're, if your company is small enough or your revenues are small enough, then you don't have to give back. But if your company has, you know, is big, then you must pay and, or, or, or give back code. And I was like, no, that's a field of endeavor restriction. That's, that's a slippery slope. We cannot go there. So I think, you know, you guys actually have this in your trademark agreement as well. You don't want any adjectives in front of PHP either, so that's interesting. All right, now here's the part. You guys, as open source developers, are already superheroes. You all are. You are now, okay? You're better programmers than, the one, than people that work inside of companies. We know that. We, you get paid slightly more. We know that from surveys because you're better programmers, because you're willing to let your code be seen by the public, generally, right? But you have some obligations. Along with power comes obligations. And this is your list of obligations. OK, ready? First of all, transparency is not negotiable in open source. It's not negotiable. To the extent that things are happening in back rooms, it's your job to bring that stuff forward, to say on the, mail, on the private mailing list, hey, shouldn't this be public? Endlessly. Because the human nature is to do stuff in the, in, you know, behind the closed doors because you don't want to embarrass anybody or yourself. But we have to be braver than that, just as with code, okay? So trans and if you see people claiming to be open where transparency is not part of their practice, that's not open source, all right? Open source is people. It's all of you. This is the Drupal community a few years ago. It, without the huge outpouring of love and work that developers have given this code base, these code bases, these projects, it wouldn't exist. A lot of communities have a credo that says something roughly like community over code, that's Apache's, or come for the code, stay for the community. And they're not kidding. 
I mean, there are people I know who, you know, got married in their community, um, invited all of their friends from their community to their wedding, um, went on vacations with their community. It doesn't mean you have to love everybody like this, but it helps because it's a different way of working, right? They used to say in the Peace Corps, this is the toughest job you'll ever love, or not just a job, it's an adventure. I, we, open source is kind of not just a job, it's a lifestyle in a lot of ways, right? Companies like to think of their resources as strategically movable. And that doesn't fit very well with open source. So to explain this a little bit better, I want to teach you this word. Some of you may already know it, fungibility. That means you're, you could work in her job, or his job, or his job, and you could be moved around like a piece on a chessboard inside your company if you work for a big company. How many of you have ever seen this happen? Anybody? It's a pretty big thing. So this is what it looks like in practice. Let's see if this is going to work. Whoops. Come on. So notice he's juggling. Whoa, the other guy's juggling. They can do this forever, right? Companies really, really like this. And there's some famous companies that are really bad about this. Unfortunately, open source developers don't like this very much. We get attached to our work, and then we want to keep doing it. If we want to walk, we want to walk because it's time for us to walk. Open source is about enlightened self-interest, right? Not just because you get paid, but because it's the best tool for you now. Or you're really getting into the community, or the work that you're doing is really interesting. The opportunities you're getting are interesting. That's why we keep coming back. Or the com and, and that's hard for companies to understand. Okay, The tragedy of the commons is a real thing. That's that this is the flip side of what about the fact that, you know, people aren't paying, right? The way to get around this in open source or the way we've done it so far is through patronage. So if you work in a company that has resources, consider patronage as something that you can do if you can't give code for some reason. So for instance, every company that I have ever worked for since I got interested in open source has dealt with the fact that I serve on open source boards and not always boards that they care about. If you hire me, and I've been on the Drupal board for four years, you're going to be dealing with two more years of Drupal, whether you use Drupal or not, because I made a commitment to that board. That's how another way that open source works, because people that decide to give service do that you know, with an open heart and for an extended period of time. We used to talk about open source as a gift culture. These days, most people get paid to do open source work. It's overwhelming, like 80%. But it used to be like 20%. And everybody else that was involved was involved in gift culture because it felt good or because it gave you an online resume. So consider patronage. Consider doing some service if you can't give code. Number five, money changes everything. Changes not only do the points of control thing happen and the fungibility thing, but also you, people start fighting <laughs> as soon as money enters the picture. I'm a, fa I'm a fan of organizations that keep the money small. Apache famously runs on a very small amount of money for the size of, of you know number of projects that they have. They do that by design. Everybody's a volunteer at Apache, and most of the money is spent on sysadmins. Right? And, and the rest of it, nobody gets paid to do. Oh, they might get paid by their employer, but not by the foundation. And I think that's really important. And along with this, <coughs> an emphasis on code is really key. It's important to look at the code. And this, some of the new wave are interesting causes, like inclusion and diversity. And those are interesting things. And we need to chip away at those problems. But fundamentally, it's about the code. And so we need to be sure that we keep coming back to the technical solution as the mediator for choices that we make. And then this argument, how many of you recommend or recognize this argument? So this is Tim O'Reilly and Richard Stallman. This is now a 15-year-old picture. They are arguing semantics, right? Richard doesn't like it when people say open source. He thinks it needs to be free software, but he can't say it without the whole sentence. And, and that's why open source won as a term. But this, this licensing war, this because it's basically a licensing war that we're talking about. On this side, it's contributions that are required to be given back. And on this side, it's contributions that could be given back, but it's not required. So permissive licensing versus copyleft licensing. 
this argument is really boring to the new wave. They don't care. They don't care so much that they don't license their code at all a lot of the time, which is bad because then you don't know what terms you can use it under. Or they choose MIT, which is the sort of lowest common denominator license, but it doesn't have a lot of the protections that you want, like it doesn't address patents at all. And so there's no patent piece in there. It, do, it doesn't address trademarks at all. Um, uh, so this is an old argument and it needs to die. We can just agree that it's the same thing now. My last point, we need to be nicer to each other. This is a pretty nice community, partly because your founder was reasonably nice. Um, there are communities that are really cutthroat and some of them need to get a little more modern. So I've been talking a lot about the wave and the problems they're bringing, but the idea of, wow, do you guys have to be assholes? is a good one, right? <laughs> and so figuring out how to gently and incrementally shift in the direction of couldn't we stand to be nicer to each other? I mean, we should still need to tell the truth, but there's, there's telling the truth and then there's telling the truth, right? You don't have to be an asshole to do that. All right. And then this is my slide where I say, this is the company I work for. These are the projects that I'm mostly leading. And if you want to talk to me about any of them, I will be around the conference most of today, part of tomorrow. Um, InnerSource is open source inside your company, as in you run your engineering that way, the way that we do in open source. And it's really, really taking off. There's lots of, of people who are really into it. Um, if you guys use JavaScript, Glamorous, which is the last one on that list, and Kraken are both projects that PayPal's released. And Glamorous is doing really well. It's a new one, a React method that I think you'll find really interesting. Um, C-Lines is a um, testing framework, and SAFE is a way to make transactions safe on the web that Doug Crockford invented, and we're working now on how, it's, it's a protocol, you can find it on our website, but we're working on how to best express that and, you know, where it's going. All right, so that is all my content, and do, do we have time for questions back there, Heather? Great. I, the best part, back in the old days, every single open source co um, keynote, the speaker took questions from the crowd. And then somebody asked a sufficiently rude question of a sufficiently important person that it all kind of stopped. But I think that's a shame. I think the, the discourse is a lot of the, pr of the thing we're looking for here. So I am willing to take questions. Anybody have a question? Oh, come on. That, ah, there's one. One second. Yeah, I think he's trying to run to you with a mic because for the recording. So you mentioned uh, the free software versus open source uh, argument and taking MIT as kind of a lowest common denominator license. Mm -hmm. um, given uh, what you said there, for for open sourcing a library or, or a project, which license would you recommend instead? So it depends on what you're trying to get at. And I, one of the blessings of working at Sun is I literally got to try every single licensing model <laughs> over that six years. And I'll tell you that permissive licensing drives adoption because most of those licenses, if you boil them down, say, just use the code, we won't sue you. The Apache license, which is very popular, and I am an Apache member, full disclosure, says, we won't sue you, but you don't get to use our trademark unless we say that you can, which is a pretty nice, reasonable thing to do. And patent piece, the way that works is, um, patents are kind of the new battleground, right? Because of trolls. So there's different versions of patent piece, but they basically say, uh, if, you, if you pee in the pool, you have to get out of the pool is the shorthand for it, right? So if you insert a patent into the code base that everybody's using, and then you turn around and try to sue somebody for using that patent that you inserted into the code base, you have to leave. And I think it's a good piece of hygiene because otherwise you end up with crazy patent wars, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm a big fan of Apache and a lot of projects use Apache. Thanks. Sure. Anybody else? Oh, there's one. So uh, 20 years ago, I was working for a company called Cygnus. Yep. And they were seen as an example of a good business model in the open source space. And I'm just curious, uh, do you have examples of companies today that are doing it right, open source 
and profits. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the example everybody wants to point out is Red Hat because they do, you know, crazy business, mostly pretty well. Um, the, in, the, in the early days, their, some of their salespeople weren't really clear. So there was a whole period in India where their salespeople were running around saying, you know, if you're making money, you can't, you can't use the GPL version. You have to pay us money, right? Um, they don't do that anymore, to my knowledge. I haven't gotten a report of that in a really long time. So I think they do a pretty good job. Um, let's see, other companies that are great. <coughs> well, there are models and there are models. I mean, Canonical is about to IPO. It's going to be interesting to see what happens there, don't you think? Uh, so that's, o that's OS companies. Let's think, think of one that's not. Um, interesting to look at Acquia. Drupal is 100% open source, meaning that all the modules that Acquia writes are put into the larger Drupal community. And uh, they're all kind of co-owned. <coughs> um, the company that, mi that Microsoft bought to look at R, which I think is, uh, I think it's called Revolution Analytics, but now it's part of Microsoft. Um, that's an interesting company. What they did was th uh, R, you know what R is? Everybody know what R is? It's a statistical language that came out of Bell Labs. Uh, well, S came out of Bell Labs. R is academics that needed to teach people how to use S, but they didn't want to pay the licensing fees, so they forked a long time ago, kind of legally, and they wrote this, this tool called R, that is an engine that is limited by the size of addressable RAM. So what Revolution did was they figured out using Linda Spaces, because they came out of Yale, how to address more RAM, how to basically virtualize RAM for the purposes of an R problem. And you know, Pfizer does their clinical drug trial crunching on R, so because of that work. That, that was a pretty great company before it joined Microsoft. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but um, they did some interesting work. Uh, let's see. Um, I mean, there are a lot of, of, there are a lot of companies that are great. I'll say that. Um, they're mostly middle-sized companies. Red Hat's kind of the, the behemoth company. Um, I like to say there are no open source companies. There are companies that are good to their open source people. And if you look at it from that vector, um, IBM used to be great, but now they make you come to work, and so there's a problem there. <laughs> my friend, my friend uh, that runs the open source division would jump right in now and say, that's not true for the open source division. So, <laughs> so you know, he's not, he's not changing the way that people are working uh, because open source people like to work where they want to work. Some of them want to come in the office, and some of them don't, right? Uh, Let's see, other companies are doing a really great job. Well, I don't know if you've been following um, Amazon, but oh my goodness, they have hired a lot of really interesting people in a really short period of time. And many of them are people who are pro open source. They just hired James Gosling, who wrote Java. Um, they have Tim Bray, they have uh, Adrian Crockford, who's a, a journalist that used to write about open source. Um, Zahida Borat, who got the UK government to standardize on open document format, and she was the first community manager for open office. She's there now. Um, it's starting to get very interesting. There. They haven't put anything out yet, though. We have to see where they go with it, right? They've got the good opportunity. And this was Google for many years, hired open source people, and then you never saw them again. <laughs> and it wasn't that, uh, that they were keeping people from outward-facing projects. It was that it's so nice to be an engineer inside of Google. It's so frictionless that you'd, it, it's harder and harder to leave the, you know, the nest, right? Um, but they came up with great projects that kind of mitigated that effect, like, like Summer of Code. They went, oh, man, we got to do a give back. Let's do one. What could we do? And they came up with Summer of Code. It's kind of amazing, right? So again, if you measure these companies by how well they treat their open source people and, and whether they're allowing people to get involved in projects that aren't directly in the line of interest of the company, then that's a pretty good company. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Why don't you ask me about anything? The Spurs, the Warriors? No, I'm in the wrong town for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> well, one over here. Uh, this is kind of a question about how communities are built and run. Uh, I've gotten involved in one called ZMQ. I don't know if many people have dealt with that at all. Uh, but it was run by a guy named Peter Hinchins who died recently, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, I knew he, Peter. Yeah, okay. 
can you say anything about his 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 policy was that anybody that had an idea, you add him to the Git administrator or whatever the thing is called, mm -hmm. and you say, yeah, start contributing, and you weed out the bad ones later. And how did that work? Uh, it seems to work pretty well. Right now, they're having a discussion about upgrading to C++ and the issues and why they didn't in the first place. And mm -hmm. it's not turned into, I mean, when I first saw the discussion, I was like, oh boy, this is going to get interesting. And it hasn't. It's stayed very calm and normal. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's just, you bring everybody in and if someone, like you were saying, you know, you pee in the pool, you get them out of the pool kind of thing. Right, right. And so I just... It's I, interesting, your question. I, so I was wondering if you've seen that anywhere else. There are lots of different ways to run a community. And if you, if you have spent a lot of time and s hopped around to a lot of communities like I have, it's fascinating how many ways there are <laughs> and, and how important some key people will be. I was on the board of the Drupal Association for six years. I, was, I got off of it in December, so kind of right before they, the problem that they had. W nobody saw that problem coming. It wasn't like it was brewing or anything, right? But um, th I was interested in Drupal because they have a really good gender balance, maybe the best in open source. And, and I wanted to understand why, and w if best means there are closer to more people that aren't men, right? Or <laughs> and um, w the reason was because of a woman who's a community manager. Her name is Angie Byron, and she is a genius at treating everybody Lightly, fully, she's in, informative, right? Fairly, and she's pretty good uh, referee if things come out of hand. But she herself, you know, she's a woman. She's a queer woman. She's she's um, pretty active in that community, and she's a good technologist. She makes good decisions, but she made it uncool to be an asshole, <laughs> and so more women felt comfortable being there for a longer period of time and also it's a lifestyle company thing where you know mom and pop start a, a company and it, how would they divide that labor is different in every single household sometimes dad does the or the man does the work and the woman does the coding sometimes it's two women or two it doesn't matter right but because it's a lifestyle company community that's part of why there are more women. But the other reason is because it's not cool to be an asshole. So in some other famous communities, it's really cool to be really tough on each other. And um, some of the famous ones, like I had that picture of Linus. You know, Linus has admitted that he has a hard time not being overly brusque with people. So Greg K.H., who is one of his lieutenants, uh, Greg Crow Hartman, is super nice. And it's almost like he takes... The, you know, what Linus meant to say was, <laughs> you know, right, he sort of softens those blows. Um, the idea of inviting everybody in and then weeding people out does happen in some other communities. And, uh, and it, how effective it is depends on how much people agree about the weeding process and whether the, the weeds are willing to leave, right, or if they're going to put up a fight. Part of the reason that that Drupal problem dusted up so big was uh, even though that's a benevolent dictator community, over the years, it's, there's become ownership within the community. There's much more ownership than there was when it started. And so when Dries said, <coughs> this person needs to leave, the community wasn't bought into that decision. And then he, he as a we, if you will, was able to, to leverage that to create kind of a bigger stink than, than it would have otherwise had. Um, in the Kubernetes community, when that thing happened just a week, two weeks later, maybe a month, um, they handled it like a security incident. You know, like, oh, something has happened. Let's take some trusted people to look at that problem and figure out what we're going to do. We're all trusted. And then we'll explain to the community why we did what we did. That's probably the way that all of the really difficult problems in open source should be handled, because it's a model we understand. Assuming you can find people that are trustworthy, or th believed to be trustworthy within this community. I know there was a lot of discourse before they made that decision, so, right, that, that might be the way to go. But anyway, if you don't, what, they, what I tell people who are just getting into open source, by all means, uh, subscribe to three or four communities communication tool, whether that's mail or a, or a group or a Slack channel or whatever it is, 
and just watch it for a while. <laughs> See which one you kind of like how it feels before you tell them who you are. <laughs> And then introduce yourself. Be polite, you know? Think of it like host and guest. This is how we explain it in InnerSource to people that have never done open source before inside a company. Say, look, when you go to somebody's house, there are house rules. They might not be written down, but they exist. So for instance, if you walked up to the front door and there's thousands of shoes, you get a pretty good idea that they want you to take your shoes off, right? <laughs> and if you don't take your shoes off, you got muddy boots and you just walk in, you might not get invited back. It's, this is common sense. And likewise, the host has to be reasonably nice to the guests or nobody's ever going to visit. So think of it that way. Did that help? Great. Somebody else? We have time for one more short question. Oh, come on. Was I boring? Oh, okay. I see a hand. <laughs> in a minute here, I'm going to make you guys all stand in your superhero power. So, yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm curious to know if you think that uh, LeBron James is actually better than Kobe Bryant or is Stephen Curry <laughs> better than all of them anyway? Well, so um, I have a foster daughter who got married in March and on the dais as she's getting married, the officiant asks in her vows, you know, love, honor, cherish, do you plan to join your husband's, your future husband's uh, campaign to make me accept Kobe Bryant as my lord and master, right? <laughs> So, yeah, we, we in California, we love Kobe. We do. We miss him. Whoop. Steph Curry is pretty cool, cool too. I mean, both of them have that amazing three-point drop shot. I mean, how do people learn to do that? <laughs> if only we could do that with code. All right, I want all of you now. You've got to stand up just for a second. Stand up. All right. I want you to put your hands up like that kid had, and I want you to say, I'm a superhero. I'm a superhero. I love open source. I love open source. All right, you guys have to go do some of this stuff now. Step out of your comfort zone. Don't let this thing go away. It's too precious. Thank you very much.